Turn on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians chapter number 12. We introduced this chapter last week. A very important chapter. I'm going to deal with, with some doctrine today. You know that sometimes you, we went through an era in our Bible leading circles, I don't know why, but we went through an era back in the 80s, I guess, and 90s, and that's 1980s and I don't know anything about the 80s and 90s, but uh, where preachers would sometimes get up and say, well, I, I don't deal with doctrine, I'm just going to preach the gospel. Did you know the gospel is doctrine? <coughs> uh, the word doctrine just means teaching. If we're not going to give you any teaching, then why are we here? Of course, the doc doctrine is very important, and like the old Southern Baptist preacher Vance Abney used to say, it's what we believe is what we do. The rest of it is just religious talk. That's right. What we believe is because every doctrine affects my behavior. What I believe will influence what I do. And so sometimes very subtle doctrinal differences can cause people to behave differently. May I say this, and I don't... I'm, I'm, I'm no expert, I'm not a theologian, I'm just a country preacher, God put in the city, okay, that's all I claim to be, uh, but, but, I, but I will tell you this, sometimes people are getting their doctrine from the wrong people, they're getting their doctrine from a TV preacher, or a radio preacher, you know, uh, when, and sometimes people are getting confused by that, sometimes it's very subtle things very subtle things that's causing them to get off track on. Uh, so I want to help you today. Uh, I, I'm a stickler on, on doctrine and being sound doctrine, having preaching what's right and truth. And, uh, and so this is, I want to draw some lines and, and clarify some things, some terms that we hear used often, but used inappropriately and wrongly. Uh, but we're talking about in chapter 12, the subject of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Uh, I asked, I asked uh, Patty and Bob last week. These folks who believe that you, uh, after you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you speak in unknown tongues. How come you've never met a deaf person, Pentecostal deaf person, speaking in unknown tongues? If it were real, you know why? It's not real. Why do, uh, why do Pentecostal folks? I know we're on the internet, my folks, this is for you. Yeah. Why is it Pentecostal folks still send their missionaries to language? If they can do what they claim they can do. I wish they could. I really do. Well, I, I see folks training for years to learn a language, but they can just go over there and say, I got it. See, I wish they could. But that's not what the gift of tongues in the Bible. Tongues in the Bible is languages. Real languages and uh, and we and so there's much confusion over the subject of the the gifts of the Holy Spirit what they're for and we clarified some of this last week what these gifts are mentioned in first Corinthians chapter 12 but we're going to take it a step farther today but I want to begin reading verse number one of first Corinthians chapter 12 now concerning spiritual gifts brethren I would not have you ignorant this is how important it is we need to be knowledgeable of spiritual gifts I'm afraid some Baptist folk have just kind of shoved it over so that's that group over there. We don't worry about the spiritual gifts here. The scripture says that we're not to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. This is important. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but of, by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts with the same Spirit. And there are differences of administration but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with him. For to one is given the Spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse gifts of kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self-same Spirit, notice capital S, 
speaking of the Holy Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. You don't need to pray for a spiritual gift. The Holy Spirit gives them out as he will. When you got saved, you received at least one spiritual gift. You may have seven, but you got one. Someone said, well, I, don't, I can't do anything. <laughs> then you're telling me the Holy Spirit cannot enable you to do anything. Because, of course, you have spiritual gifts. Everybody has at least one. And he gives them out as he wills. Then you notice, it goes on to say, For as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all to drink into one Spirit. Now, we looked last week to this passage of Scripture, verses 1-13, through 13, about the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit, they are to lift up the Lordship of Christ. That's what, they're not to uh, lift you up. They're not, somebody said, well, this is my lame prayer language, or this is this gift I use it. I'm self-edifying. That is a terminology not found in the Bible. You're not to self-edify. You're to edify others. Amen. And we find here, that's why you were given a spiritual gift. If you have music ability, it was not given to you to edify you. It was given to you so you could edify somebody else. If you have ability to teach, it was not given to you so you could edify you. It was given so that you could edify somebody else. And say, so much of our Christianity is what, I, what am I getting? What do I get out of it? Not what am I giving? What am I contributing? How am I being used of God? And so we find the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to lift up the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then uh, we see the, uh, the working, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is to make believers profitable in God's service. In my flesh, there is no good thing. And so many times we see Christians give out, they burn out. You know why? A lot of it, they're doing it in the flesh. Amen. You see, the difference is, is the Holy Spirit enabling you to do what you cannot do on your own. You will burn out in the ministry. So many have gotten involved in the work of God. They'll come and say, oh, preacher, I think God wants me to do this after three or four weeks. I don't want to do that no more. Oh. And uh, I've had enough of that, preacher. What happens was they were not following the leadership of the Holy Spirit or they were and tried to do it in the power of the flesh. You can't do it. I can't do it. None of us can do it. So I said, well, I could never live like a Christian ought to live. Of course not. That's why we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. He lives through us. Someone said, there's only been one person to ever live a Christian life, and that's Jesus. And the Holy Spirit wants to live a Christian life through every one of us. We can't do it. Uh, I remember how overwhelmed I was as a new convert. I, I just thought, man, if I could just quit cussing, I'd be at the top of the spiritual chain. Yeah. If I could just quit cussing, you know, not, not the other things, I'd give up on that. But found out that God, the Holy Spirit, can transform us from the inside. Yes, sir. And so we see the working of the Holy Spirit, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is to give gifts as He wills to believers so that we can serve Him in our church. That's why I'm going to get into some things today. You see, God wants to use you in the local body that He has put you a part of. He wants to use you there. He wants to use your effort. And you see, God has given you the ability to stand up and to be used. And so nobody should be sitting on the sidelines or periphery. Nobody. So I said, well, I don't do anything in church. Well, pray tell. Why not? Why aren't you doing something for God? You've been given the ability to. You've given all that's needed to do it. It's just not a matter now of the will. It's like she shared her testimony this morning. Now it's just a matter of surrendering. Because God has given us ability. And it may not be in the area that you had previously to being saved. You know, I think Dan Tony uh, put it well when he talked about when God saved him and called him to preach. He said he was so backward. This is his terminology. He said, I was so backward, I was afraid to lead in silent prayer. <laughs> now, you know what I'm talking about. You know, think about with today coming up here and stand up and sing. There you are. And, and, and you're all staring at him. Y'all staring. Listen, that's a scary thing. But you know what? If that's what God's called you to do, He will enable you to do it. Amen. He will help you to do it. If it's not what He's called you to do, then He may not. Because that's not what your gifts are. He's got something for you. There's something for each one of us. 
Well, he's saying Southern Indiana, God made a persimmon tree for every possum. There's something for you. There's something for you. God has it for you then. Notice, talking about the leadership of the Holy Spirit still, this baptizing by the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, has to do with uniting with a body and serving Him. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, I am a Baptist. What I am about to give you is Baptist theology. I'm not interested in any other kind, but I'll guarantee it's not what many are getting on their television preachers and so forth. And many Baptist preachers are a little confused on their doctrine in this area because the truth is, whether you realize this or not, historically, Baptists have not been writers. Uh, we've got, you know, I think probably going back... Uh, Way back, John Rice was probably the first Baptist writer to write many books. Baptists were not writers. They were practical. And many of the writings of early Baptists were burned and destroyed. They were hated. Baptists were hated by both Catholicism and, get this now, the Reformers. So we identify with the Protestant Reformation sometimes, but did you know Martin Luther was no friend of Baptists? That's right. Now, Martin Luther was a great man. I'm not criticizing. I think you ought to give credit where credit's due. But he did a lot of harm to Baptists. He hated Baptists. Now, but here's the problem. with Baptists preach. So my friends preach. They go off to a Bible college. Most of the textbooks were not written by Baptists in the area of theology. And so uh, in my library, I have theology books. Most of them are written by Presbyterian, uh, are written by uh, uh, Reformed theology, theologians. Uh, now, very few Baptist writers. We, we were into the practical. And that's nothing wrong with that. But what it does, it leaves the next generation kind of in the dark. Things that, that Baptist preachers and from the reading and studying many times did not pass that knowledge along to the next generation. And so, when, when I... I became a Baptist very early on. I got saved in a Baptist church, independent Baptist church, but I didn't know anybody. Some of you have a similar testimony. So I went to a church where they had a big youth group across town where the pastor was not even saved. As far as I know, has never received Jesus Christ as Savior. I've witnessed him. But they had a lot of young people that I knew from school, and I went over there. And, uh, and so it was a, a non, what they call a non-denominational church, and I'm, and I'm not into denominations, but I am sound doctrine. And uh, this particular church called itself a community church, and in its constitution it said we want to be open, our doors are open to all faiths. If you are a Buddhist or a Hindu or Muslim, you can come to our congregation and feel comfortable worshiping there. That's a little too broad. All right. That's a little too broad in your doctrine. And so I went over there. And so uh, we had that pastor left. And a new pastor came. He was a young man. I just got his doctorate. Uh, and just he graduated from Midwestern Baptist College. The college used to be up in Michigan. And he was a Bible preacher and a Bible teacher. He loved people. He was able to be patient, yet teach the Word of God. Our deacons got saved. Sunday school teachers got saved. I mean, it was a revival spirit swept through that church. They had never heard, some of them very sincere people had never heard the gospel. Now you can be born again by trusting Christ your Savior. And he began to preach. And in the heat of that, God called me to preach. In the midst of all that. And but people would ask me then, what are you? Are you a Baptist, Methodist? And so I made a mistake. I thought, well, I'll find out. I'll over here. So stay with me. Don't get mad at me until you hear the whole thing here. Right? Uh, I went over to the Methodist church and said, boy, I'm going to see who the most godly for where people are. And I went over and met the Methodists and, and I found out they weren't very godly. Some of them weren't. And it really turned me on. And so I went over to the Baptist church. And I, I met some of them Baptist folks and they weren't doing any better. Some of them were just living ungodly lives. And so I, I went over to this group and that group. And finally I said, I don't know what I am. Because I was trying to figure out what I was based upon people. And somebody, in fact, there's no Methodist preacher who said, what you need to do is quit looking at people and get in the book. That's right. Find out what the Bible teaches. And so I got in the Bible, and then as a, as a kid preacher, a teenage preacher, and you're in a small town, every church invites you to come speak at their youth group. Oh, we want to have Tom Fry come preach in our youth group. And I preached in this youth group. And I preached to every church in town in their youth group. Uh, but, it, but the longer I studied the Word of God, the fewer churches wanted me to come back. I didn't know what they believed. I just believed the Bible. But sometimes what I taught from the Bible was not what they believed. They said, we don't want him back here. He's messing. He's confusing everybody. 
And so it got to be a very small group, and the only ones that let me come back were Baptist. And so I must be one of them. And so I began to study the Bible, and I believe I am a Baptist tonight or today because of the Bible. Yes, sir. That's why. Not because of Baptist people. Not because Baptist churches are some of the best churches. I'm telling you, I'm, I believe I'm a Baptist because the Bible made me a Baptist. Amen. And that's the only reason I want to be a Baptist today. And so I've been back in Baptist churches many years. And But what I'm about to say is not what you're going to get from most of the Protestant churches what I'm about to say. Uh, and you're not going to get it from the from the mega church uh, on television. You're not going to get it there. In fact, it's going to be contrary to what they say. They just want you to keep those checks coming in. They don't care about what you believe. Just keep those checks coming in. Uh, it's like that... Uh, well known uh, TV preacher some years ago, he said, uh, send me your prayer request. And he said, alongside that, send your, your seed faith check. Uh -huh. And send it to me. And you know what? The address they had on it for you to send it to was not the ministry, it was the bank. And so those checks would get to the bank, they would open that up, the bank would take that check out, and deposit, and throw the rest of it away. There was nobody even looking at those prayer requests. Because it wasn't about that, it was about. Building their empire here on earth. Listen, no preacher has a right to try to build an empire here on earth. It is our job to build the kingdom of God. Period. Not his ministry. Not his church. This is not Tom Fry's church. This place belongs to Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. And not me. And by the way, it doesn't belong to the deacons. And we've never had that kind of issue arise here, but I've been in some churches they thought the church belonged to the deacons. Never. Not to the deacons, not to the, not to the Sunday school teachers. It belongs to Jesus or it doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to Christ. Amen. Now, when we get to the latter part of this chapter, where I want to spend just a few minutes today, I want to talk to you about a love for the body. A love for the body. Now, notice with me, beginning in verse 14, let me read on down to the rest of this chapter and just point out several things. How a love for the body. For the body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye. Now you have to know, it is in the scriptures humorous sometimes. You just see the big eyeball rolling down the side wall. That's, that's the picture he's painting. And uh, that's exactly what he's saying. He said, uh, if, he said but uh, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased Him. And if they were all of one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God has set some in, in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and shew I unto you more, a more excellent way, which he will when he gets to chapter 13. Charity. No more excellent way. Now stay with me now. There's some terminology we need to talk about here to help us. It's very important terminology. You understand, when you get saved, I don't care if it's out on the street, if it's in a church, you come down the aisle, the preacher's preaching, or so when or not on your door. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are a member of the family of God. Yes, sir. 
And uh, if you understand, that means you are going to heaven. Come on. Somebody says, well, what if I mess up? You will mess up. I guarantee it. Because uh, we all have it. In First John, if we God, we say we have no sin, we lie and do not the truth. Of course we mess up, but thank God we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, think of this now. We become a member of the family of God. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That little statement alone ought to be enough to call the Baptist to shout. Yes. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ himself. Yes, Think of it. Whatever Jesus has, he shares it with you. That's what salvation is. It's not like, I got religion. No, you didn't get religion. You got Jesus and everything that goes with it. Yes, sir. You got eternal life. You got a mansion in glory. You got a new body waiting for you someday. I mean, you got all that. It's in Christ Jesus. You got it all. And, and, and it's eternal life. John 3.16. Somebody said, uh, well, how do you know that you can't lose it? I thought I had was John 3.16. That would be enough. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have, what's the word? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. He didn't say temporary. He said everlasting life. And so when you get saved, you're made a member of the family of God. Now, some terms that sometimes get confused then, you're here, and I, I want to try to help you with this, and, and we'll see the application here. Is that they'll say, Well, I'm a member of the church. You join a church. Whether you join a church or not, and you're saved, you're going to heaven. I'm for church. Yeah. I believe church is very important. I think our culture today has minimized the importance of church. And I'm not bragging about it, but I, this is just a fact. I've said before, from the time I was 16 to today, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, I don't think I missed more than five services wow. in all those years. But I have people who miss church all the time. They don't go to church half the time. I don't know how you do that as a Christian. I don't, I'm so convicted when I miss it. I'm laid in a hospital bed sick, and I'm, all I can think about, I'm supposed to be at church right now. I'm supposed to be at church right now. And yet, people that make so little of church now, but you don't get saved to get in a church. Stay with me. You have to join the church. You have to join it on purpose. Now, that's why I, I, I don't use this term. It, it, not, not that it's necessarily wrong, but uh, somebody said we're talking about the rapture of the church. Now, I, I don't use that term because it seems to imply you have to be a member of a church to get to go up in the rapture. And there are some false top doctrines of some Baptists that got into that. They call it Baptist Brides. They yeah. thought if you weren't a member of a church and the, and the rapture takes place, you don't get to go. Yeah. I think I say you can take, you can go down here to the uh, to the store and get you some of that Lebanon bologna. <laughs> and you can slice it thin and you can slice it thick and it's still bologna. When people say you're not going to go up in the rapture because you're not a member of the church, that's just some Lebanon baloney. I mean, it's baloney. You're going to go up whether you've ever stepped inside the doors of a church in your life. Now, I don't advocate that kind of Christianity, but the truth is, if you're saved, you're saved. Jesus coming back for, his, for the family that, that those are in Christ are saved. Now, but when he talks about church, there are, that word church, ecclesia, and I don't want to get deep here, but you find the word church means a visible, called out assembly. Church. There are some folks that have gotten over and say, well, there's no difference between the church age and the Old Testament age because it talked about the church in the wilderness. The Bible does use that terminology, but the church in the wilderness is not the same as the New Testament church. Alright? Uh, you study the two, they're not the same. Now, the the, was it a church in the world? Yes, but it was a visible, called out assembly of Jews that had been led out of Egypt. They were a church in that, in following the very strictest meaning of the word ecclesia. They were, but they, but they weren't. They're not a New Testament church. And uh, there are others who take it and say this. They'll say, "Well, well when you get saved, you're, we're all members of." It. And he'll say, "The church." No, you're a member of the family. It doesn't make you a member of the church. That makes you a member of the family. Usually what that means is they go to Bedside Baptist on Sunday morning and they have a comforting message from Pastor Pillow each Sunday week. Now, but you understand, a church is a visible, called out 
assembly of believers. Now, is there the word church used as referring to all believers? Yes, it is. On maybe once or twice, the rest of the time it's always talking about a local church. A couple passages where it seems to imply that it's talking about the church of the firstborn, talking about one day there will be a visible, called out assembly of all believers. I don't care from all nations, all ends, whether you ever were a church member on earth or not, you're going to be a part of that church in heaven. Where we have all nations praising God and singing to Him and worshiping Him. Now that's that's the church of the firstborn. That's that's the church that Jesus. But you'll find in the New Testament now, there's the church at Philippi. Wait a minute, that's a different one from the church at Ephesus. And you get over to Revelation, it talks about the church of Philadelphia, church of Laodicea. These were all individual churches. The word churches is used in your Bible. So if the word church only refers to all believers. How would you ever have churches? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be logical here. Why, why is this so important? They say, well, you're just, you're just splitting hairs. Yes, I am. But there's a reason why. I think we ought to be true to the Scripture because we, when we take that position, we devaluate the importance of your local church. In your local church, whether if this is your home church, then God has given you gifts and abilities to be used here. We cannot be, Ambassador Baptist Church cannot be the church it's supposed to be if we have hands not doing the work of hands. And we have feet that do not do the work of feet. We have eyes that don't do the work of eyes. We have ears that do not do the work of ears. Every member of that body serves a function and purpose. This church, by the way, we forget this when we read in the context of a book like 1 Corinthians. It's written to the church at Corinth. The local church at Corinth. It was a local called out assembly of believers who had been saved, then baptized, and then coming together to serve the Lord there. God wants us to, uh, when we when we wants us to find us a church, be faithful there, use your spiritual gift. That church needs your spiritual gift. If if God listen, if God doesn't want you here, then don't come here. Go somewhere else. But give God your hands there. Give God your heart there. You be used of God. The word God, we say this, I grow or well, you've been planted. Stay there. Do something for God. Your church needs you. Your church needs you. Listen. Some folks will be gone for several weeks and they come back in and uh, they don't realize we were not what we were supposed to be all the time you were gone. We could not be what we were supposed to be all the time you were gone. Because it would be like uh, someone having their arms severed from their body. Or their foot severed from their body. Or their eye knocked out. Uh, you see, there, you, you're, you're a member there. You are a member and a very important one. There are no unimportant members of this body called church. Yes, sir. Each one of those are to be a body of Christ. Churches. Each one a body of Christ. Uh, people come to this church or any other church, what they ought to get when they get there is Jesus. Yeah. They ought to get Jesus. Just give them Jesus. It ought to glorify Jesus. It ought to honor Jesus. It ought to uplift Jesus. It's about Him. And that's what's so important. Uh, we find here, now those, those may seem like little things, but you know what? Here it is. Here comes this fellow on the radio or TV. He said, uh, send your tithe to, to, to here. And the tithe ought to go to the storehouse. It ought to go to your church. It ought to go to your church. I, and you know, if you want to, I'm not against giving to other ministries. I know we've got several people in this church. They, they personally support missionaries beyond what they give to the missions of our church. Not a thing wrong with that, but they're, but they're givers in the mission of the church. And they work here too. Uh, I read with Ronald Reagan one time, and I know sometimes people say, who? who? Uh, yeah. Ronald Reagan, when he left California and later joined the church, uh, East Coast. Did you know he kept tithing in every church that he was ever a member of? He continued tithing there as well as the church he moved to. Wow! Because he believed and honored that church where he was fed and helped and encouraged his Christian life. Uh, listen, uh, find you a church, pour yourself into it. Your family life ought to rotate around the church schedule, not the church schedule rotating around your family schedule. Some folks have trouble getting a hold of that. Yeah, yeah, get it. Get it. This is this is prior. This is this is not 
for Ambassador Baptist Church. This is for Jesus. This is his body here. This is for Jesus. We ought to rotate our schedules around here. Uh, that's why we try to put out the church schedule. It's, it's on the internet for the whole year. That's why we put, print it out, put it out there so people can plan. That's, it's, it's good for you to take vacations. It's good for you to but you plan it around the church. You don't plan a, revi plan a revival and then folks go on vacation a week to revive. They haven't even checked to see the priorities in their life. The church! This is what he's talking about here. You are a part of that body. If you're not there, that body will not function like it's supposed to function. You are a, you make the church, your church, a cripple when you're not there. Not only not there, but praying. Oh, we need to pray for your church. You need to be a party. You ought to present yourself. And listen, God moves you somewhere in the part of the country. What's the first thing you ought to do when you get there? In fact, you ought to do it before you move there. Before you accept that job in that other city, you ought to go visit that other city and find out if there's a good church there. If there's not, turn down the job. But what? God's not using your job to, to reveal His will for your life. He's going to use your church to reveal His will for your life. Mm. Well, we think it's about, well, i got a job going down there. That must be where God will know. It's where your church is. But organize your life around your church. Now, I'm not even saying, well, well, you're just trying to get us to be more faithful here. No, I want you to be faithful wherever God takes you. Get in the church. Be faithful there. Every time the doors are open, be there. If they have a chicken plucking, you ought to be the first one in line to grab a chicken and let's go out. I mean, anything takes place at the church. Be a part of it. Find a place. I, you know, it amazes me we have vacation Bible school. So I'm not involved in the kids' ministry. But there's something going on at the church. Be there. They need you. Well, uh, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested. Find out what, uh, what's going on. Be a part of everything you can. I know you can't be a part of everything. but And you have to start. But most people don't have a problem with spreading themselves too thin in the church ministries. But I understand that. I have been around some people who have. So you have to keep that open. But love the body. Love this. I've said this before. Some of the meanest, rotten scoundrels I've ever met in my life. You know where I met them? Church. I met some dishonest people at church. But the sweetest, kindest, joyful, encouraging people I've ever met in my life. You know where I met them? Walmart. No, no I didn't. It wasn't Walmart. I met them at church. Amen. Why do we want to let a, a couple sourpusses spoil us from joining church? Get in there. Get, get both feet wet. Jump in there. Don't just be a, a tender. Be a server. Don't just be one that shows up once a week or some people, you know, twice a year, Christmas and Easter. I'm here. I, Christmas they show in like they've been there all along. You know? I, no, you, you have not been here all along. We need you every time the doors are open. We need you. The church needs us because you're part of the body. You're part of the body. So we find here the love for the body. The term local church has sometimes been misunderstood. I'm reading Dr. Peter Masters' quotation here. Has been misunderstood. And people have gained the impression that they should always seek membership at the very nearest evangelical church in their home. It simply describes an individual congregation as distinct from the church universal or any group of churches. It describes a congregation which should be working under the direct rule of the Lord. In today's urbanized world, believers cannot always live in the immediate vicinity of their church for a variety of reasons. Listen, it doesn't have to be the church across the street or, or the church in your same hometown. You find a church that stands for the Word of God, that's winning the lost, that's where you go. You, you find that, you go find out the church near where you live that preaches the Word of God. It doesn't have to be the biggest church. It could be a little storefront place. It could be a big church where they have many ministries. But it could just be a storefront of 10 or 12, but they have a burden for souls and they preach and believe the Word of God. That's, there are no little churches in the economy of God. Every one of them are important. Amen. We find the importance of this church. Now, in verses uh, 14 to 26, he talks about as members of the physical body. All members are necessary for proper functioning. Members of the body thought to be less honorable are to be bestowed more than abundant honor. Uh, how many have ever injured your thumb? Well, I got five fingers here, four here. It makes a big difference. You get that thumb, you ever, if you wounded it or hurt it, and boy, you think, 
You can't even button a shirt. You can't get dressed without that without the pain in that thumb. It seems like a very small thing. How about your feet, Keith? We were working out here, and I had there was some uh, when we were working on concrete. They put some duct tape down over the that water. We get into the water line down there, and, they, and so we poured concrete. I reached down to pull that. It's just some duct tape, but I got down. To, but my pinky got under it, and I picked it up like that, and it pulled the pinky up joint. Yeah. It's just a little thing. You know, it was months that thing hurt, and every time I did something, oh, ow, oh, ow. You know, there are a whole lot of churches ooing and owing today because somebody who doesn't think they're more important than a pinky thinks that I can just miss it and it won't make any difference, but the whole body hurts when you're not faithful. The whole body hurts if you're not there. Submit to that body. Yield to that body. You see, every member of our body yields to the brain in the same way that every member of a church yields to the Holy Spirit. And let Him lead your life and guide you. He is the brain of this operation. He is the administrator of the work of God. And then the church members in particular. And He names the people. He says, some that God has set in the church. He said, and then, by the way, that's how I know the term body and church are used synonymous here. He actually used the word church here. And says, uh, God has set some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, uh, gifts of help, and uh, uh, gifts of government, uh, diversities of tongues. And then he asks this question, look with me in verse number 29 of our text. In verse number 29, it, let me find look my page over here. Verse number 29, he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? And the that's a rhetorical question. And, and the answer to those rhetorical questions is no. No. Not everybody's a prophet. Nobody, not everybody's this. Not, everybody, not everybody's a pastor. Not everybody's a Sunday school teacher. Uh, not everybody's up on the platform. But that person you've never seen on the platform is just as important as the person on the platform. Uh, sometimes we as preachers, we get a little egotistic. Like, what would you do without me? Probably going to serve God. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not supposed to be leading. It's an example. But understand something. It's not about me. It's about you. Yes. Every one of us. And you know you're just important in Baptist Baptist Church as the pastor. You're to be as faithful as what you think your pastor ought to be. Now that's scary as you do some. Uh, now, do I go out of town sometimes? I do. But when I go out of town, I make arrangements with somebody to cover everything that I do. I do the best I can. Make sure somebody's going to cover this night, somebody's going to take care of that. I just don't leave. You say, well, that's because we're paying you. You're not paying me to be the pastor. You're taking care of me because I'm your pastor, but you don't have enough money to pay anybody to be a pastor. It has to be God's calling to the task. It's not about the money. I don't know how any preacher gets rich in the ministry. That's honest. I don't know how they do it. I know maybe some have, but I don't know how they do it. Uh, I guarantee you, I've, I've, in my ministry, I've had to pay to preach most places I've preached. I had to pay to be there. And... Uh, I guarantee that probably, and I'm not saying this, Greg Dosley or confuse anybody, but I, I would say very few people in the church, this church doesn't make more money than I do. Very few. Now, does that mean I don't have to be as responsible? No, it has nothing to do with the money. I'm not here because of the money. I'm here because God told me that this is where, this is, this is my little pea patch where he's got me. And I come up here and pick my peas every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, right here. But God's got a pea patch for you too. He's got a place for you to serve. Whether it be in the deaf ministry, wherever you teach in a Sunday school class, driving a vehicle. I, I heard a fellow say the other day, you know why more churches don't have more bus ministry? They said, because nobody's willing to drive. Not because they don't want more. You know why churches don't have more Sunday school classes? It's because people are unwilling to teach. Not because there aren't plenty. Did you ever look out there? There's a lot of people out there. <laughs> But it's labor. Jesus said, pray you therefore the Lord of hearts to send forth labor. It's always a people problem. I challenge you that. Find out. He said, well, I'm not an apostle. Okay. 
I'm not a prophet, okay? I'm not a teacher, okay? I'm not a worker of miracles, okay? I, I'm not a, I don't have a gift of healing, okay? I don't, I don't have a gift of tongues, okay? I don't have a gift of interpreting, okay? But God does have something for you. You notice there are several lists of the gifts of the spirits in the Bible, and they don't all agree with each other? Right. You know why? Because it's, if you come to the conclusion that, that that's not a complete list, God calls people to do whatever needs to be done. Did you know, I thank God for people who clean the toilets, aren't you? Amen. I thank God for people who do the little things around that vacuum the floor, set up songbooks. What, where would we be if those things did not get done? So many times, people have to do them because the people who are called to do it don't do it. Did you know somebody here called to clean the building? Just as truly as the pastor's called to stand here and preach, or somebody called to clean the building. There's somebody called to drive every vehicle. To knock on doors, to go out and serve the Lord, teach that Sunday school. It's a matter of unsurrendered people. And usually the unsurrendered people are the most critical of everything that's going on. Well, I just don't understand why they did it. Well, they wouldn't have to do that if you did what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got people who are not called to do certain things trying to take up the slack for those who are not there. I'll close with this today. On February the 29th, 1964. About 150 Christians were gathered for service in the house of Alexander Gushin in Siberia. All at once, right in the middle of service, five swearing, half-intoxicated officers broke into a meeting. And they ordered them to disperse the church meeting. Instinctively, the people there that day huddled closer together, forming a human barrier between the the uniformed men and their pastor. I like that idea. Uh, somebody break in it between me. But I, 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 it reminded me years ago in the jail. We had a fight to break out in the jail service that we were holding. We had three ladies there, part of a trio, to sing. And the inmates that were saved is from the wall. So those ladies stood back there on the platform, safe. Immediately when the fight broke out, there's a line of men lined up right there just to make sure those ladies kept safe. That's what happened here when those guards broke into the service. Angry, frustrated, the officers forced some of the Christians out into the cold night and herded them into a waiting truck to take them who knows where. Just at that moment, the pastor shouted, Wait! If you're going to take some of us, you've got to take all of us. We're one family. What happens to one will happen to all. Remember, there's 150 of them. They got one truck. Of course, the police vehicle was too small for everybody. So the whole group marched behind it until another truck was sent. The ordeal ended at the Region Executive Committee building with all 150 members singing praises to God. The solidarity of these believers was so bewildering to the authorities that they released all of them in a short time later. Listen, that's how it's supposed to be in the church. If I'm hungry, you're supposed to feed me. If you're hungry, I'm supposed to feed you. When you're hurting, I'm hurting. When I'm hurting, you're hurting. That's how it's supposed to be in the local church. It's not that I just show up and, and we're, we're part of this. If one of these kids come on the bus, that's trouble. I, I'm, I'm amazed that people don't even learn who these kids are. It's like, yeah, that's what's kids come they're important as any other person in this church. And we don't take, I'm, I'm a basic pastor, so I don't even know who the kids are coming in on the buses and being so. That's shameful. We come in and sit in our own little pew where we stay, that's what pew does. And we sit there and we own stink, and then we leave and don't we don't walk up to one person you don't know, introduce ourselves, we don't go and talk to anybody, we don't ask anybody to have something we can pray for them for. We don't check and see if they have a need this week that I can kind of meet. We don't care. We come in and we go out because well, I'm an arm. But what good is that arm? If it's detached. What good is it? It does nothing. In fact, another place in this book I refer to the disarming of the church. We disarm. We cut the spiritual arms of the church when we're not faithful in our church. We need you. This church and other Bible believing churches need the members to be faithful to God. I'll close with this. You've been driving out through the country. I recall an incident years ago like this. 
I was driving with Coke Country, I was doing some vlogging at that time, I was out looking for a guy, and I had an old BMW, beat up BMW motorcycle, I was driving back and forth to work. And I noticed when I got beyond Linton, Indiana, there was a, a church building sitting alongside the road. And uh, weeds were all growing up there, and trees were growing all around it. And it didn't look like that old of a building, but it just sat there all growing up around it. And I remember I pulled that motorcycle off of the side of the road, and I went up, and I went to, I was looking around, I, I was noticing. And I went up, and I, I was looking in the front door, and I went on the side door. The side door was not locked. In fact, it was ajar a little bit. And I stepped into that country church. And I was amazed when I got in there. All the pews were still there. The pulpit was still there. The songbooks were still there, covered with dust and cobwebs and filth. Everything was just like they walked out the door. <coughs> now, I don't know how you react to something like that. I started weeping. A place where somebody used to, where people used to get sick. Where the Word of God used to be proclaimed, just now set Decay and rotting. And I asked myself, how did that happen? And yet I've seen it happen so many times in the years now. Hundreds of churches across America close their doors every year. And we say, well, how does that happen? An arm is not where it's supposed to be. Foot is not where it's supposed to be. And the people are, oh, I shame. I always appreciate that little church up there. We were having that church. The arms quit coming. The feet quit showing up and quit serving. The, the ears quit hearing. The eyes quit seeing. The hands quit laboring. And there it is. Empty memorial of what used to be. No church can say that cannot happen to us. It's happened to many churches. It's happened to churches that ran thousands of people Sunday after Sunday. It's happened to small storefront country churches. But it all happens the same way. Folks are not assuming their place with the spiritual gifts that God has given them to be used in that local body, to reach the lost, to edify the saints, to build up one another. So we can go out and uh, shape the world for Christ. We need you. I need you. Christ is you. It's an amazing thing. God doesn't need anything. He needs us. He desires to use us. Our Father, Lord, I pray that you help us. Lord, you've gifted us. You've enabled us. You've given us an ability to do things Lord, for you. And yet, many times, it's the very things you've gifted us to do that go unknown. Nobody does it. Nobody picks up the slack. Nobody goes. Nobody works. Nobody prays. Oh, what a terrible tragedy that is when it happens in the church. Lord, it could happen here. It could happen anywhere. No church is in need. The Lord's need. We read the scriptures. Lord, help us today to find our place and serve you.